The Chronicles of Ensign Inoue Part 3 is brought to you by Kumute Radio in association with Flow Combat. Ensign, in this episode, breaks down the first few years of his fight career. He mainly competed for Shudo and Valley to Japan. He breaks down every single fight, gives the behind the scenes of that fight, and gives his perspective of what actually happened. He talks about Zulu, the mystical figure that we all know that fought Hicks and Gracie in his first two fights. And he basically breaks down everything that happened before he went to fight for the UFC. Make sure you follow Ensign on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit his website, destinyforever.com. Now, let's get it started. We're back for the, the ep- part three of the Chronicles of Ensign Anyway. Of course, joining me is the legend, Ensign. How are you doing? You're rolling in your ride, driving around. Where are you going? Yeah, we're just getting home. Uh, Sarah got a fight coming up at um, September 23rd, so we just got done with the training, did some sparring, working on some of her ground stuff, so just coming home from training. That's kind of ironic because today we're going to get into your first fight for Shudo, and isn't her fight for Shudo? It's her second fight in Shuto, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it shows you how long Shuto has been around. Yeah, right, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> now, we last episode, or uh, part two, we ended with you talking about how you got involved in Shuto and you kind of like making audition tapes and, you know, going around and figuring out who you want to fight for. And you finally, wow. you finally decided... 1995, January 21st, was your yep. first fight versus Shingo Shigeta. Is that, am I pronouncing yeah. that right? That's perfect. All right. Now, you won that fight, TKO, first round. Take us back to that fight, like before the fight, during the fight, after the fight. Well, well, like I said in the last one, before the fight, I wasn't even planning to go into the pro- professional ring. I wanted to just get that experience. To go in the ring where it's one man against one man and have that jitters and control that anxiety. But when uh, Simon wanted me to go pro, I was like, whoa, first, my first thought was, no, I'm not a pro. I want to start amateur, just one fight, just feel that feeling and that's it. But he assured me that don't worry, don't worry. We'll make sure, you know, your ground is good. We just work on your tackling. So in preparation for that fight, we just, I was doing a lot of tackling, a lot of wrestling rather wrestling rather wrestling just taking down taking down so yeah so it was uh i was a little bit uh, unsure about going to the pros but um i just had to trust that simon thought knew that i was ready and just went to the grind of training every single day moved into the gym in fact but you you worked on your wrestling and your ground game was legit already but you won by knockout no i won by mount punch oh so you were in the mount yeah, so the the actual strategy was perfect. Um, I created a, I mean, my standing suck. It still sucked into the end of my career, but I was like kind of jabbing, jabbing, waiting for the opening. And when he tried to set up for a punch, that's when I shot. Perfect timing, took him down. And of course, in Japan back in that day, no one really knew what the ground positioning was, so easily got a mount and just mount punch. And it was really neat because. You know, the Gracies uh, teach you that the mount is spear position. You're done. Fight's over. But when I got into the mount and started striking, what I realized was once you get the mount, doesn't mean it's over. Now it's another technical battle to to try and finish from the mount, to try and find the strikes, not to burn. I mean, believe it or not, you can actually burn yourself out mount punching. If you think it's that easy, you think you're going to get mount and just punch someone out and knock them out easy, you're in for a big surprise because there's a lot of techni- technique involved. And I actually got tired punching from the mount. So the fight ended where um, he was, uh, I got into the mount. He had no clue how to escape, but I had to really, my mount punching sucked. My, you know, like, you know, when you punch, your elbow has to be behind the fist. But I was hitting like almost like a racquetball punch, almost like a whip. So that I had to work on. And even finding the, the openings for the mount punch. I, I was punching over the guard, and um, of course, it was enough to um, get the guy into submission. You know, because back in that day, too, the rules weren't really um, structured well. 
So I think the last eight punches I hit the guy with was in the back of the head, right on the neck. So <laughs> that's when it, the rules were okay to do that, yeah. After that fight, you mentioned earlier that you only wanted to have like one fight, experience it, and maybe it's going to probably be over. After that fight, did you feel like you needed to fight more or did you want to just quit, not do it again? Well, my whole thing was one fight and I'm done. So I, I got that fight. I, you know, for me, it was really weird because I didn't see it as a sport. I saw it as a street fight. And in a street fight, it's you, you kill or be killed. And, I, you know, big thing for me was that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight till I die. And when I won the fight, of course, it felt like, okay, you won. That means you didn't die. So for me, it was more of a relief that, okay, I went into the ring. I got this experience. Um, I didn't die. I'm still alive. I'm done. Okay. I mean, it's not going to, it didn't make me a perfect human being where I can control my emotions to anything, any, any type of scary experience from here on out, but it definitely gave me the experience to be a better, have better reaction to something that happens r rather than me not having the fight before. So I felt, okay, I didn't expect to become a perfectly controlled emotional human being. But with that under my belt, I thought I was a better person than if I didn't have the fight. So I was ready to move on. I was done. Mm -hmm. And the first inkling I had that I might have to maybe fight another fight was two days later, the fight magazine came out. And we were the second fight of the night. But usually the second fight of the night, there's like a little black and white with your name, who Ensign Inouye defeated. So you get the single time, what, what, how you beat him. But I had like a full color page picture mm. and it said something like, of course, I was I'm American, but it said something like a Japanese knows Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He's a monster. And I was like, whoa, what a write up. I was like, shit, this is like almost like going to throw them a curve ball because I'm going to come out like a monster and boom, disappear and retire. And that's when Sayama came. We went to dinner the next night, and Sama straight up was, okay, the next one, we're going to fight. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. One and done, one and done is what I tried. And then I saw how excited he was. and All the time, the three months training he put into me, and, you know, of course, his, his whole excitement about, you know, the groundwork that he's trying to uh, convince the Shuto fighters that the ground position is important, which they didn't agree with in the beginning. I just looked at him and I think, shit, you know what? I can't just turn my back and leave now after all the time he's put into me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to fight one more fight. But then you moved on to, did he also own Valley Tudo Japan? Yes, he was the one running Valley Tudo Japan. So he got excited and he said, three months later, he told me, I think it was in April. He said, Valley Tudo Japan. I said, oh, yeah, shoot. Because Valley Tudo Japan had different rules where you could stomp the face, you could stomp the, you stomp the feet, whatever. And it was interesting because his whole idea was, we'll put you in the tournament. And for me, um, I was still very loyal to Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And when I knew that Hicks and Gracie was going to be in the tournament, I mean, not that I, I was conceited and thought I was going to win and beat everybody and end up fighting Hickson in the finals. I just It was just the idea of if for accepting to be in the tournament that Hickson's going to be in. It's almost me saying, yes, I'm willing to fight Hickson, mm -hmm. which I wasn't. And not because I was scared. It was out of respect that all my ground fighting I learned was from the Gracies. And... I was not about to use my technique that I, they've taught me to try and beat or kill someone, one of their brothers. Mm -hmm. So when Sayama came to me and asked me to get in the tournament, I declined. I said, if Hickson's in the tournament, I can't fight in the tournament. That's when he suggested a one match. And I was like, okay, if it's one match and it's not like I'm disrespecting Hickson saying, yeah, I'll fight you if I win the tournament. If we meet in the tournament, we'll fight. Then I'm got good. So he got me a one match with a, uh, Orlando guy, uh, Rene Rose. And that was a, that's where the second fight was set. And it was really, um, for me, it was, uh, it was a really huge step because when I went from a Korakuen, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 people seats to uh, fight in Valladolid, Japan against Rene Rose 
in the, the Nihon Budokan, Japan Budokan, Tokyo, oh, it's a Nihon Budokan. Mm -hmm. And that has a 50,000 seat arena. So it was like, for me, you know, being the second fight of the night and then getting into that big of a stage, it was, it was pretty uh, mind boggling. So at that time, time. You're in your second fight for Valley to Japan, they're already selling out stadiums? Yeah, that's because I think the Valley to Japan before in my bank, the um, Hickson fought in a tournament and he, he beat, um, I think he beat uh, David Lubecki and Nish, 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 Nishida, Nishio. Mm -hmm. In the finals, yeah. So he won the Valley to Japan. So Hickson was a big name, and Hickson's coming back for the number two tournament. So yeah, it was it was huge. Valley to Japan was pretty big. So it was filling up. They're filling up fifty thousand seat arenas. The UFC can't even do that now. That's yeah, incredible. Japan. Even Japan, like you know, the rising too. They still have. I think they still have the stadium set up at like twenty twenty five, twenty two thousand, or fifteen thousand. When we when I fought in Pride, when we, they had the you had the stadium set up at fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Even when we fought at Tokyo Dome, fifty thousand. Back in that day, man, it was crazy. It was huge, man. Yeah, that's incredible. In nineteen ninety five, fifty thousand person arena sold out to watch yeah. you fight. How did you feel when you're walking out in that environment when you? We're used to playing racquetball. That was like your previous experience as a professional athlete was racquetball. And how many people were watching you playing racquetball? Yeah, most people you probably have watched maybe 50, 60 people in a, in a court arena, yeah. Because you can't get much people in the um, to watch from a racquetball court, yeah. So not much. But yeah, it was a surreal feeling because, of course, when the fight happens and you walk into the ring, you're focused on that one guy that's going to try and hurt you. Mm -hmm. But when you're, um, it, the, the, what actually hit me was before in the arena. When I got to the arena, we, you know how you do the ring check and you're sitting there looking at the seats and looking at the, the Tokyo uh, Budokan, the Nihon Budokan is built where it goes straight up real high. It's not like a real gradual when it goes straight up. So when you're sitting there looking at the seats way at the top, you're like, wow, this is huge. And <clears throat> like when the, when the, you have the, um, ring entrance where you're introducing all the fighters and you're sitting there with the crowd, you're standing in the ring like, holy shit. Yeah, it's a real surreal feeling. But um, when um, when the fight happens, man, there's there's just me and him in the ring. So it was an interesting fight because in that fight, Hickson came down for the final and it was a real unusual format where they, they said that they allowed the fighters to hold the ropes. Mm -hmm. So that the kickboxers could hang on to the ropes so they don't go to the ground. So I was like kind of, I felt really uneasy about that. Hold on, I'm going to reverse. That. I don't know if you can hear that. So I felt really uneasy about the fact that they were going to hold ropes. So at the room meeting, I went up to Hickson and I told Hickson, what are you going to do to hold the ropes? And he, he made it sound super simple. He goes, they hold with the right side, you hit with your left. You hold with the left side, you hit with your right. I'm like, ah. That's simple enough. So I said, okay, so me and Egan kind of, yeah, this shouldn't be a problem. They're going to hold on. They're going to hold on with their hands. They're not going to be able to block the punches. We'll just hit them with whatever hand they're holding with. Okay, cool. And then Hickson goes into his first round with um, Yamamoto. And Yamamoto does exactly that. And Hickson can't get him down. He, he's not that simple to hit on the side. He's holding the ropes. And we're looking at Hickson struggling. He he had a real hard fight because the guy wouldn't go to the ground because he was holding onto the ropes. And right there, me and he looked at each other and said, holy shit, what are we going to do? And that's when we had the idea, like, shit, foot stomp. If he holds on like that, stomp on his feet. And my opponent was 6'8", I think, or 6'7", or 6'8". So his feet were like bolts. So, to, you know, so he just step on his feet. And, you know, you know, you have these... Until you're really in a fight with another professional, you have these little illusions of how simple things would be. Like these, uh, these are very um, mystical um, fighting. Okay, you do this, boom, hit his arm and break his arm. Like, yeah, right. It's not going to be that easy. So we looked at that and was, yeah, fucking step on his feet. We're going to break his feet. Step on, you know how the feet has all the bones like the hands? Mm -hmm. Step on that, boom, and it'll break it. Like, cool. So now, so we got the foot stomping in and then 
the whole match, I liked the opponent because he was a real aggressive, dirty fighter. So he was like a real, um, he took the fight to the person, went and attacked, and I thought, oh, this is the best kind of guys to take down. So then, okay, I'm going to wait for his attack. I'm going to change levels, take him down, get him to the ground where he has no ground. He's a kickboxer. When in the ring, if you watch the fight, it's like this guy wouldn't make a move. So I'm standing there looking at this six, seven guy, and I'm trying to faint for a tackle, and he's just like making real short moves, just waiting for me to commit. And I'm like, holy shit, this guy's not coming at me. And to a point where I was like, you know, I got to entice him. So at one, right before I shot for the tackle, I was kind of like, pointing at my chin to him, come on, come on, let's go. I'm coming, come on, let's fight, fight, fight. And he went and I just shot in. Guy in the clinch, and sure enough, he wrapped his arms around the ropes. Uh, and that's where, that's where it got really long. Uh, what happened was I, I was foot stomping. The foot stomping was hurting him, but it wasn't this foot stomp that I broke his arm. I broke his foot right away. Just a foot stomp. So I was slowly getting into the foot stomps. So the foot stomps, they couldn't get the foot stomps in. And I was getting it in, and then he wrapped the ropes. And what he was doing was really hard. Was he was healing me? So you know how you're standing up, and I'm I'm clinched onto him. He's healing the back of my calves, and I, and it started taking a toll. And I remember at one point I was in the clinch, and I was thinking, shit, what am I gonna do? And then finally, I just had this English. He was um he was holding onto the rope. So I thought I my first thought was, oh, rope is fair play, so I can use the ropes too. So I, and he was, the other thing he was doing to me, I was real bad. He was elbowing. He was so tall. He was elbowing straight down to my shoulder blades and my head and my neck. So I was like, okay, one, I got to get rid of those things. So what I, what I did was I stood up onto the first ropes. That way I was almost as tall as him. And then his, his leverage, he didn't have leverage anymore. So that took that away. And then as I was doing that, I was saying, wait a minute, fuck his when he had his hand wrapped over my neck, I said, shit, his back is right there. So I thought, shit, he's using ropes. I can use ropes. I climbed up to the second rope, got to his back. And then right there, I was saying, shit, his neck is right there, wrapped around his neck. And then he tried to jump out of the ring. Mm -hmm. Because he's so tall, our whole momentum was already over the top ropes. He tried to jump over the rim. And when I saw the video, the shooto referee grabbed his leg to stop him from going over. As I'm still singing in the choke. <laughs> So it's kind of funny because I remember thinking I had the choke in. I remember him trying to jump out. And I was thinking, you know what? I don't care what happens. If I fall, hit my head, I don't care. I'm going to hold on to this choke, and we're gonna, I'm not going to let go. If we fall out of the ring, he's going to be asleep on the ground when I get up. And But apparently, we kind of went out. We kind of went all the way over the edge of the ring. And because of the ref grabbed them, they pulled us back in. I was sinking in the choke. He fell on the ground, and he started tapping. And that was the end of that fight. So... Got rid of that, got over that fight, got out, walked out into the arena. And when I walked out into the arena, got into my locker room, my calves just tightened up. And it, it had contusions in both my calves. And I could hardly walk after that. So it was kind of a, was a lot of damage. I took a lot of damage on my legs. But that was done. And, of course, Sama comes in again, all excited and wants to, okay, the next one. We'll do the next fight, and it was crazy, man. It went, it went just one, one fight to another, one fight to another. Yeah, so who was my... in your first fight, you didn't really take much damage at all. In your second fight, you just mentioned that you took a lot of damage to your legs. Did that yeah. was that something in your mind when you went into your third fight, or before you even went into your third fight? You're like, hey, this is kind of too taxing on my body. Should I? you know, not continue this? Or did you not care about that? Did you just think that no, I didn't was care. part of the game? That wasn't even an issue for me. For me, it was like, I, it wasn't about taking injuries. I was just pretty much like, I, I, I see, see, you got to remember, yeah, I wasn't going in as a sport. It was going as in a street fight, live or die. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was alive, for me, it was like, that's great. I, as far as body injuries, if you're in a going to a ring prepared to die, Contusions is nothing. Mm. If you go into a casino lose winning to lose fifty thousand dollars and you lose ten thousand, it's nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you go into the casino wanting to break even and walk away with your money and you lose ten grand, that's devastating. Yeah. If I went into the sport trying to go out so I can maybe train tomorrow or the next day, that's devastating if you get contusions and you're out for two weeks. 
Yeah. But for me, going going in with the will to die and accepting that I might die today, coming out with contusions, broken arm, doesn't matter, man. It's like it's really nothing actually. So yeah, that wasn't a that wasn't even a issue for me. Mm. And it was pretty uh after that that fight it was done and then yeah, of course, went back to the arena. I mean, went back to the gym, and Sam was like, oh, yeah, next, next well, who are we going to fight next? I'm like, oh, shit, he wants to fight again. What am I going to do? And I, again, I had that obligation that, okay, all that time, good fight again, I'll do one more. And the next fight was, I think it was uh, Orlando um, Cage Fighter. He won the Orlando Cage Fighting, and his, his uh, name was Edo, Edo de Clef. And he was a wrestler, and that's when uh, Sam was excited. I said, okay, I'll do one more. <laughs> and that's when we went to the third fight, yeah. So the first three fights of your career were like, you started off, I'm going to just do one. And then your motto became, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do one more. Because of the promoter and your obligation and kind of like, it seemed like you had a lot of loyalty to the promoter. Yes. I was grateful that he gave me a chance to step in the ring. And my idea was getting the experience in the ring. And, uh, you know, after I got that, it, it wasn't, I almost felt like if I, if I left now, it's like I used him. I asked him to give me a chance in the ring. I got the experience. Okay, I got what I want later. And all this time, his, his, uh, his loyalty to help me and let me chase that dream of getting into the ring once, I felt, I felt it'd be like a little bit of disloyalty if I turned my back on him now. So it's like, okay, now one's getting two, two's getting three. Now this is a little excessive, but I felt I was just moving fight by fight. And I felt like I owed it to, I, I think as I'm out of loyalty to him, appreciation for what he's done, I'll do one more. And that's when we booked the, the next one, yeah. So that so was a, the third fight coming up. So you're in Japan, you're Japanese-American, at that time, did you kind of become the face of Shuto, or were you still building your name? Okay, so what happened with the Shuto whole thing was when I, when I went into Shuto to showcase me, Sayama changed the Shuto rules, mm -hmm. and he called them freestyle rules. So we allowed ground punching, because before then, there was no ground punching in Shuto. So, yeah, so I became the face of freestyle shooter. Mm -hmm. So Saima had this dream of moving over to the real type of fighting. And he felt that, you know, the pancreas, rings, all those ones, they only have open stri open palm striking. Mm -hmm. There was no real fighting. And Shuto also only allowed no ground punching from the mouth. So when he created freestyle fighting, it was like a whole new movement. And it was like a, almost like a thing in Japan, like, holy shit, what's this? What's going on here? Some of the fans were freaking out in my first fight where you, from the mount, I'm just pounding them out. They're like, whoa. It kind of took a little, a lot of people back, mm -hmm. and they were kind of tripped out on that. But so, yeah, as far as being the face of Shuto, you know, the Shuto had a lot of stars already. Kawaguchi was one of the stars. I think uh, Sakurada, Gutsman Sakurada was another one. And um, Nakai Yuki was one, a waterweight champion. And what I became was the face of that new style freestyle shooting, which was which, which Sayama thought was going to be the future, which that bugger saw and was before his time because look what it is now. It's the, the freestyle shoot is what the UFC is. It's what pretty much, with, with, with a little bit of rule changes, that's what it is now. So he had that right vision that this is the new thing and this is what he wants to do. And I was the one to represent Shuto in that. The stars that are already developed for Shudo, you mentioned some of them. Were they accepting of you? Or were they kind of like, you know, standoffish during this time? Well, they weren't standoffish to me, but they were standoffish to Sayama because when he introduced me to them, he was explaining to them that ground positioning is important. And they were all into the catch wrestling where positioning wasn't important. They flew into the flow, which is good too. Catch wrestling is awesome. You flow into all these different blocks. And a lot of them wouldn't admit that. Mm -hmm. So Sayama would go into the big Shuto meetings and tell these people, okay, we got to work ground position and no one wanted to do it. So how he actually convinced them was at the gym that we used to train at, the one that I took over, the purebred gym, they used to, it was called Shuto Gym, Shooting Gym Omiya. 
Mm-hmm. Well, everyone would gather once a week to, to have like a group sparring. So all the top shoot fighters would go there. So there was one point when we had all the sparring going and we did a, we had, we sparred with the MMA gloves. We got on the mount, everything, and we did positioning. And then from the positioning, because Shuto, the general style, had no ground punching, he wanted to emphasize how dangerous the mount was. People didn't think the mount was that dangerous. Mm-hmm. So I remember I was sparring with Sakurada. I got him to the mount, and then, you know, you're trying to submit or trying to hit the body or something. And then Sayama looked at me, he goes, okay. And I looked at him, he said, what do you mean, okay? And he said, punch. Oh, like, punch, was punch, go for it. So I just pummeled Sakurada pummeled him like he was you know you you see someone trying to get on the mount they don't know how they're kicking their legs and they're twisting their legs they have no clue that's what he was and i was just pummeling and boom after that round was up he just he was busted up he sat down looked at sammy he goes holy shit mount is dangerous and that's where it changed everything all the shoot fighters interested in learning ground so that's changed the whole uh, movement of i'd say not just Shuto, I think mixed martial arts in, in the whole part of Japan. Because Shuto was the pioneer of freestyle, um, say, so they called it Vali Tudo at the time, mm-hmm. but MMA. Shuto was a pioneer of MMA in Japan, which was pretty much the beginning of uh, um, uh, MMA fighting. Definitely. Going back to the sparring, when you say that you guys were wearing MMA gloves, how different was it? Compared to the gloves that are used now. MMA gloves are the same. It wasn't like the finger gloves that Pride started doing. It was more gloves that was uh, um, like a big fat padding on the top. There was a lot more cushion on the pads. So, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glove that um, Sayama actually um, innovated and invented. It was a, li- a little bit different. And, of course... It's, it's changed since then, but that, yeah, it was a little different. We had MMA gloves. He, he, I think Sayama had the first MMA gloves out. The first Shuto MMA gloves out. Now, your first four fights, the first, your debut, you beat a Japanese fighter. The next three fights, they were all American, am I correct? Uh, the first fight was a Japanese fighter. The second fight was a, um, what is that? Orlando, yeah? So, what is that? European, yeah? And then the third fight was uh, another European from, uh, I think, G- Gerard Gordeaux was from where? Where was Gerard Gordeaux from? <sighs> Netherlands, yeah? So, he was from the Netherlands, too. And then my third opponent was, uh, oh, that's Edo de Clef. He was from Netherlands, too. And then your fourth opponent, Andre Manart. Where was he from? Shit, Andrew Bernard was from the Netherlands too, yeah, I think. So all of the guys you were fighting were from the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, they're all guys. You know why those Netherlands guys, they're game as shit, man. They'll fight anything, you know. So, you know, the, the second fight I, I really wanted to take because it was one of Gerard Gordeaux's students. Uh, and I didn't like Gerard Gordeaux because he is the one who um, dug his fingers into a... Uh, Nakai Yuki's eyes and blinded Nakai Yuki. So my whole thing was I'm fighting his student. I want to beat his student up and then I'm going to disrespect him or something. <laughs> so I went in there and then if you watch the fight, I, Edo de Clef, of course, didn't understand the ground. So I got his back and he, as I was slipping off, I, I locked into an arm bar. And then from the arm bar, I finished his, you know, I finished him. And then I remember walking around the ring and I remember looking over at Gerard Godot and thinking, I'm going to fucking punch this guy in the face. He was in the corner. And he was complaining that it was stuck too soon and all this bullshit. Big fight. I actually went there and I walked around him as almost about to punch him in the face, but I didn't. Yes, yeah, so it was kind of a funny fight. It was a real, um, it was a kind of a personal fight for me. I wanted to fight him. So got over that. And then again, you know, if, uh, going into the fart fight again, it was the same thing. Like, you know, S- Sam was all excited and he had this whole thing about, yeah, you're going to fight a K1 fighter now. And I was like, oh my God, okay. I thought to myself right there, okay, this is the last fight. This is the last fight I'm going to do. I'm going to fight this and I'm done, for real done. And yeah, like you said, um, the first, the fourth fight was Andre Menard. He was a K1 fighter, so legitimate K1 fighter. And 
again, the whole game plan was he's a good striker. I'm not going to strike with him on the ground. So my whole game plan was to grab him, take him down, and um, submit him on the ground. And that's where the fort, fort, the fort fights happened. Um, everything went well. Um, I remember thinking my whole game plan was I'm going to close distance. So I'm going to keep moving forward until I get to this position where they have to, um, he has to make a, a move. And then when he did, I took him down, controlled him on the ground, uh, got him to the mount, and mount punched until he, um, the ref stopped it. So that was well went real smooth. And that's where everything took a change. That's where I sat back and I was like, okay, I just beat a K1 fighter. Although, you know, K1 has no ground still. The fact that I beat a legitimate fighter, I was sitting back and right there, everything in my head changed. And I was like, wait a minute. This MMA shit, I might be really good at this. Now, all of a sudden, there was a curiosity in myself is how good could I be? I've just beat four fighters. The last one was a really legitimate fighter. And I was like, man, you know what? I got to see what I can do. And right there, my whole thinking changed. Everything was about getting experience, going back to Hawaii. And then all of a sudden, I was like, okay, you know what? This is something I want to see what I can do. I'm going to go full-time in this. I'm going to see what I can do in this. And that's where everything changed, where going back to Hawaii wasn't the main prior priority anymore. The pro main priority became seeing what I can do as an MMA fighter. So – in your first four fights, you were a full-time fighter then. You weren't really doing nothing else except for training and getting ready to fight because the promoter was always on you every time you won, right? He's always like, hey, when's the next fight? When are you going to fight again? This is when you're... Well, actually, what happened from there was I was a, from English teacher. I went to the racquetball company. I was kind of doing the racquetball company while I was training. But because of the fighting, I went, I went and made it. Because, you know, for me, it was like the harder you train, the less chances of dying. Mm -hmm. So, of course, every free time I have, every time I have any, you know, option to train, I'm going to train. So, yes, training. I, I was kind of full time, of course, doing the racquetball business, taking racquetball orders, sending out rackets. But other than that, yeah, pretty much full time training. Wanted to be prepared. Didn't want to die. Mm -hmm. So I just, for me, it's. It's not about winning and losing, but living and dying. So for me, it's like, if you're going to die, and you're going to train hard. So I made sure that I could be as ready as possible so I could live another day. So you mentioned after your first four fights, you realize in your mind, you're like, hey, maybe I'm going to try to take this as far as I can go. And then you took on a fight with Joe Estes, and you lost by decision. Now, explain that fight. Explain the mindset of going into that fight where it's different from your first four fights because you're thinking like, hey, I'm going to try to, you know, do something with this kind of like as a career. What was lucky with that was for me, if that fight happened, the fight before, I would have been done. Because uh, they would have told me that, you know, you're not good enough. Okay, remember what you came in, you didn't come in here to try and win a belt to become the best in the world. You went in here to just get the experience of controlling your emotions. It's done. Okay, you just lost. Done. But the reason why it helped me continue is I already had my mind made up. I already had my mind made up. I'm going to see as good as good as I can be. How, how you know. And with Joe Estes, after I lost that, the only thing I felt was he overpowered me. He was just too big. Mm -hmm. And so right there, if you notice the changes in my body, right there I thought, you know what? I got to gain weight. I got to get stronger. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started trying to put on weight. I mean, without steroids, man, the most I could put on was like five pounds in a year. Five good pounds. So... It was a real slow process. And, you know, steroids wasn't illegal. But I was too scared, you know, like steroids. They say steroids does this shit, changes your voice. Well, you know, they, they gives you bitch tit or, you know, all this kind of side effects. And for me, in racquetball, I never did any steroids. Steroids wasn't actually an option. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I was afraid to touch. I mean, I've... I've never done drugs. I've never done any cocaine, um, any chemical drugs. Even marijuana, till that day, I've never done it. I've done, I did marijuana later on in my life, but mm -hmm. up until then, no drugs because I was afraid of doing that kind of stuff. I was a little chicken in that kind of sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I knew I had to gain weight, and I thought, okay, 
The only reason why Joe Estes beat me was, one, Matt Hume is a smart motherfucker. And everything mm -hmm. I was trying to do, Matt Hume was in the corner telling him to be careful. And it was like, mm -hmm. I was in there trying to set something up and Matt Hume's letting him know. I'm like, fuck, what am I? Fucking Matt, you know? So Matt Hume was an awesome second for him. And the other thing that was real hard for me was his size. So I thought, okay, technically he's not better than me. So that didn't make me think that I'm not, as, I'm not good enough. It's just he was, I think he was... Um, 50 pounds heavier than me mm -hmm. and he was stronger so i just thought okay i gotta gain weight i get stronger and it'll negate the fact that he can overpower me with power so that's what happened in that fight it did it didn't because i already had my mind made up that i'm gonna try and see what i can do i wasn't it wasn't a one and done see what i can do if you're gonna see what you can do in a sport or any type of profession you're gonna grind it out to see try and get better from the losses and mm -hmm. improve, improve, improve and see what you can do. You know, it's not going to be one. Okay. I'm not going to see what I can do with the person that I am today. I'm going to see what I can do with the adjustments I can make with every lesson that I learn in the ring, win or lose. And that was just a lesson in the ring. I'm lucky. I had my mind made up that I was going to do this because if not, it would have been like, okay, I'm done. So lucky. But didn't weren't all your previous opponents much bigger than you? Yeah, um, Shigeta was about my size. Uh, Lenny Rose was huge. Yeah, I mean, tall wise, he was um, six seven or six eight. I'm not sure, but of course, weight wise, he was heavier. Mm -hmm. And then Edo de Clef was a little bit bigger, not that much bigger, but a little bit bigger than me. And then we got uh, the last one was um, Rene uh, Rene Rose. And Monard was a little bigger too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rennie Rose was bigger. Um, Andre Menard was bigger. And then Estes was huge. But I, I was in there to – I wanted to see if I was one of the strongest men in the world. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't about I – wasn't I wasn't willing to go into weight classes. I wanted to fight unlimited. So my thing was you can be the lightweight champ. You can be the middleweight champ. But if it's a heavyweight, what happens then? So for me, it was – I mean, you got a heavyweight champion – fighting a lightweight champion, he's going to beat up the lightweight champion because he's so much bigger. So the, um, a bigger, a good bigger man will always beat a good smaller man. I believe that. So I felt like to test myself and see if I can beat one of the strongest men in the world, I would have to fight the biggest people. So I didn't want to drop into weight classes. I was easily could have made light heavyweight, but I didn't want to. So I was trying to gain weight that time. And even with, um, after the Joseph's fight, that's when I said, you know what? I got to gain weight now. If I'm going to fight these big boys that's 50 pounds heavier than me, I've got to gain weight. And that's when the mission went on to starting to lift heavier, starting to eat more, trying to keep my weight as I train. In 1995, 1996, were people taking steroids that were fighting? Not in Japan. Not that I know of because Japan is not a country that is accessible to steroids. Mm -hmm. It's not a country that um, actually – is an option to steroids. You can get steroids in Japan. There's no black market that I knew of. There's, I mean, I, I heard later on the pro wrestlers had a black market going. Mm -hmm. But as far as in the racquetball world, in the fighting world that I knew that day, I knew no one that did steroids. So for me, it was not an option. It was something that I wasn't willing to try because I was scared of it. And it wasn't accessible. And there was, it wasn't like some dude that was doing good saying, hey, you got to do steroids, I'm doing steroids. It wasn't like that. So it wasn't even a thing that people would try to get you to do because they're doing it. No one did it. So it was something that wasn't even a, a consideration in Japan. You mentioned Estes' corner man was Matt Hume. And you see what he has done. He's been around since the beginning also. A lot of people forget that. They just think of him as Mighty Mouse's coach. What do you think of his accomplishments now as a coach? And then he's the one that was actually in the corner against the guy that beat, uh, gave you your first loss. Matt Hume's a pioneer, man. Matt Hume is not just a good coach. This guy can actually go in there with his boys and spar with them and still beat them. I, mean, I remember Sakurai is really good. Sakurai, Maha Sakurai. He's a real good fighter in Japan. But he told me that he would go into um, AMC spar with Matt and Matt would beat him up like whoa so yeah Matt Hume is not just a good coach or a good fighter he's a he's a well-rounded intelligent person and that's one of the reasons why one of my goals is to get Sarah to go to train with Matt Hume mm -hmm. and I've already talked to him he's gave me the okay 
and he's talking about later on this year or even early next year, I'm going to fly Sarah out there to be able to work with him. Matt Hume's uh, instruction, not only technical, but his conditioning is, is top par, man. His conditioning training, his cardio training is like the best in the world. So definitely want Sarah to go out there and, exp you know, explore that arena. You know, Sarah just went to uh, BJJ United in uh, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And I, I went out there and worked with them too, man. Those guys are like the top jiu-jitsu school that I know of. And I'm getting back in shape. I am possibly want to maybe do a jiu-jitsu match or even a submission grappling match. And if I do, that's where I'm going to train. BJJ United is where I'm going to train because there's beasts out there. And they got super good instruction. And I consider them family. So that's, you know, that's, so I'm exploring. We're, Sarah for Sarah, we're exploring different places to go. For her ground and her jiu-jitsu, BJJ, there's none other than BJJ United. Mm -hmm. And then for her conditioning and maybe just to branch out and some MMA and some, you know, some different ideas, I definitely wanted to go check out Matt Hume. After that loss, it was a majority loss, and you went and you returned to the, to the ring again two months later, and you lost by knockout to Igor... Yes. Zeno Vivev, I think I'm saying that wrong, but, you know, <laughs> these names are very difficult to say. He goes Zeno Vivev, yeah. Yeah. Now, going into that fight, what was your mentality? Did you, you know, you said that, you know, you were, you were in there because you, you were just there to fight, right? So were there training camps back then, or were you just training and then whenever a fight came up, you just took it? It didn't matter what No, I got, I, got, I got ample notice about the fight, and I got – I went to training camps. So a lot of the times I'd fly up to Hawaii, back to Hawaii, and I train in Hawaii with Egan. Mm -hmm. So for that fight, yeah, I was ready. Um, I was still, you know, trying to work, um, trying to see if I can, uh, what I can do in the world. And then when I got into that fight, what, what opened my eyes with that fight is I was uh, not brainwashed, but I was almost led to believe that the guard position was an aggressive position. It was a safe position. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in that fight right there was that the ground being on the bottom, just being on the bottom itself is a dangerous position. So that was a good eye opener for me. If anything, that fight, if anything, was a fight that really challenged my idea of continuing or not. Because I remember walking from the ring after that knockout. I got knocked out. I was walking back and Egan's not a fighter. Egan's more jiu-jitsu sporty guy. So we're two different types of people. And Egan, I remember Egan telling me walking out is, man, this MMA shit, there's too much to cover. Go back to jiu-jitsu. And I was literally like, yeah, you know what? I think this, I'm done with this MMA stuff. I don't think I'm cut out for this. I want to back to jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu was my bread and butter. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know, it was about, you know, about time to you know, maybe stop. I just, my fifth fight, I lost two in a row. I'm done. And so I actually went back to the gym thinking that I'm done. I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to tell Sayama that I'm going to stop? I'm just going to jiu-jitsu, maybe go back to Hawaii and, you know, call it a career. It was a nice little stint. It was fun. And I learned a lot, controlled my emotions better. I'm going to be a better man. Now I'm done. And as you know, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first point of your career where doubt crept in, right? Like yeah. doubt creeps in, and I, I'm, you know, every fighter probably goes in, goes through that, and every person in the world goes through that whenever they're doing anything. How did you get over that doubt? Well, you know, what was real hard. Was I trained so hard for that? I was so ready, and I got knocked down in seconds. And I was like, it's such a letdown to walk in there and then just have this your your whole world just disappear on a mistake or you know just a little maybe he held the guillotine a little long and i was a little lightheaded and that's why i got caught with the punch i don't know what it was but it's so frustrating and it's so it, it really it's a real heavy cloud over your head when you get that and you know for for me it was i was i was almost wanting to be done i thought about what egan said and and something about it in me was i didn't want to go out that way I just thought, you know, I, I'm not a loser. I know I'm not a loser, but I don't want to look, okay, bum, 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 win four fights in a row, lose two, disappear. And I thought, you know what? I can't go out this way. I've got to, you know, I've lost two in a row. I got knocked out, decision, and then knocked out. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to do it one more time. 
I'm not going to quit on myself now, but I'll do it one more time. And you know what? If I do shitty and I get knocked out again, I'm going to be real about it. I'm going to say, I'm done with this. So right there, I thought, okay, I told Sayama, one more fight. And he goes, who do you want to fight? Let's get you an easy one to win. I said, no, 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 no. I told him, I want to see. I don't want to waste my time. I want to see if I'm made for it or not. And if I'm not, I'm done. And he goes, who do you want to fight? And I remember that Valley Japan, when I got knocked out with, there was this guy named Mustafa Abdul. Mm -hmm. He was a fucking beast. He fought Kikuta, which was a very good ground fighter. Kikuta had a leg lock on him. This guy just healed him, kicked Kikuta in the face, just was nonstop relentlessness and pounded Kikuta into submission. And this guy was like built like a beast too. So when I, he, when I thought to myself, okay, if I'm going to see if I really made for this, I want to have someone that's going to beat the fuck out of me and see if I can overcome that. So right there, I looked at the Sam. I said, I want to fight Mustaf. I mean, there's a point in the fight that Kikuta had Mustaf in like a straight knee bar, mm -hmm. extended totally. And this guy would not give up, kept kicking Kikuta in the face and eventually got out. So I'm thinking, that's the kind of guy I want to fight. I want to really see for real if I'm ready, made for this. I don't want an easy fight. I want someone that's going to break me again and let me know straight up I'll, I'll know in my heart I'm done. This is not, I'm not good enough for this. I'm done. And so I asked him for Mustafa Abdul. And Sayama looked at me and said, Mustaf. He said, you don't want an easy one before taking someone? I said, no, no. I said, I don't want to waste my time. I want to see if I'm made for this or not. He goes, cool. And that's when that fight was booked with Mustaf. So we know what happened in that fight. Yeah, that was a good fight. I, I mean, I, I dropped him. He started tapping. And I remember this is also a big where this a fight that refined the character that I am in the fight is I remember dropping him in the fight and I remember seeing him tap. So he was tapping on the mat right after that first punch. And right there for me, the ref didn't tell me it's over, but I saw him tap and it's just over. Tapping means it's over. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went up by the ropes, went up to the ropes and kind of started celebrating. And I turned around, the ref's giving him a fucking standing eight count. I'm like, wait, he, so I looked at the ref and I said, he tapped. You can see it. If you watch the video, I'm like, he tapped. And the ref kind of looked at me like, huh? And then I looked over at Mustav and he was ready to fight him and thinking, his head is clearing. The more, the longer I wait, I'm not going to argue with the ref because his head is clearing. So I went in for an attack again. And I dropped him again. And this time I started hitting him until the ref pulled me off. Mm -hmm. And right there, I, it created this belief in my head that my job as a fighter is to render my opponent um, helpless, make him give up, make him quit. Or in my ideal was to kill him before the ref could stop me. So my job as a fighter was to hurt my opponent. The job of the referee is to make sure I, he stops me in time. So it wasn't my job. I'm not going to play fighter and referee at the same time and try to hurt him and decide when it's enough and stop. It's not my job. My job is to hurt him until the referee pulls me off. And that's where it just changed my whole mindset that, you know what? I'm not going to focus on anything but hurting this guy, hurting this guy. And if I don't hear the ref, it's the way it is, man. Until he pulls me off, I'm not going to stop. So that's what refined the way I fight, you know, that fact that I almost – I had to beat Mustaf twice. And that's dangerous. I don't, I don't want to ever do that again. So I thought, you know, that from then on is my job is to hurt him. And I'm going to hurt him until someone pulls me off. And that's what happened after that. Abdullah, he – did he ever explain to you why he tapped and then he got up and continued fighting? Um, no, I never did talk to him about it. I just, I mean, he, I mean, I guess there was no clean cut rule. You tap, you're done. Like now they say if you tap a certain amount of three times or four, three times or more, you're done. But I don't think there was anything like that. So when he came in, when he tapped, and of course he tapped saying, okay, I'm done. And then, he got an eight count. Oh, he, maybe he thought that tapping man, he gets an eight count. There was no clean cut rule. So as far as I'm concerned, he did nothing wrong. I mean, tapping in jiu-jitsu is, is done, but we're talking MMA now with a new, a new style that's just came up. And we, hadn't, we didn't have any like straight up, like your tapping's done, you know, tap three times or more, you're done. You know, It was such a raw sport yet that we didn't have anything set. So as far as him doing that or even asking why, it was not even a concern of mine. It was something that I made a mistake on. It's not what he did or what he did good or he cheated or he tried to get sly or anything. It was just me. It was, I got to do my job. My job isn't to see if he's safe or he's going to be okay. My job is to hurt him until someone stops me. 
So it just took, that's what it refined for me. So was that fight kind of like your first turning point of your career? Was the, what, could you say that your killer instinct was reborn in that fight or? What would you um, say? Yeah. For, yeah. Well, one of them was um, the first, the beginning of that whole thing was um, Edo de Clefia. Yeah? Because when I had him in the armbar, his arm was popping. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking to myself, I was, I was in, inverted, yeah? So I had enough room to hyperextend and even break his arm. So as it was popping, he wasn't tapping, but the referee saw how extended it was and stopped the fight. And he and Gordo started complaining that, mm-hmm. that he wasn't done. And I was thinking to myself, well, f- well, I feel the same way. The ref should have let me go so I could break that motherfucker's arm. So I felt like I, 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 they felt like they was cheated. I felt like I was cheated. I got into a perfect position for an armbar, and the ref stops me before I could finish it. Mm-hmm. And it's like they're complaining. The ref just saved your motherfucking fighter's arm, and you're complaining to the ref. I should be complaining because I was in the perfect position to break his arm, and he stopped me. So right there, I was saying, you know what? You know how you extend the armbar, and it's like you kind of like, like in practice, you're just extending and doing, giving the time guy time to tap. Yeah, I'm like fuck that from now, man. I'm gonna. That's where the first thing is. You know what? I can't. It's not a sport. You, mm-hmm. you break his arm. You gotta grab it and break it. So when I when when from there, I thought to myself, when I get an arm, I'm gonna bust it. And mm-hmm. you guys saw that happen in uh, Royce Alger's fight, yeah. <laughs> We're jumping <laughs> ahead, but yeah, yeah. So that started the whole momentum. And then as far as the not stop punching like that, I had that um, for the. Mustafa do fight, yeah, I felt like I, 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 because he tapped and I made my own judgment, I played referee and I said, okay, he's tapping, it's done. And when I started kind of raising my hand saying, yes, I won. And it was like, uh, I had to beat him twice. And, you know, an interesting thing with that is if you look at all the fights, any fight you watch from now, watch the reaction of the fighter and the corner after the fight is done. What those reactions will tell you is the concern that they had mm-hmm. at the moment the fight was done. Okay, so if the fighter is totally confident he's going to beat win this fight, when he wins, there's not going to be much invo- emotion involved. He's going to be like, yes, you know. But if he's worried and he wins, it's going to be like, yes. Like some of them cried because it shows how much they were, it, they were very um, worried about how what they're going to do. So mm-hmm. sometimes it's real interesting because you see the fighter like totally like real stoic. Yes. And you see the fight, the corners going nuts. That, that means the corners were super worried about the outcome and the fighter wasn't. So if you notice all my fights, Shigeta, um, De- Lenny Rose, um, Andre Menard, um, Edo De Clef, they were all pretty much, I, I had the confidence I was going to win. Mm-hmm. So when I won, it was no big celebration. But when I beat Mustafa Duel, you could see me. I stand in the middle of the ring, kind of look up in the air and scream. It's like it was there. That's how much worry I had in the ring. So, yeah. So that fight, um, it was it was a big turning point. Even you look in the corner, Nakai Yuki was in my corner in that fight. He was crying. He also knew that if I lost this fight, I was done. Mm. So he was actually in tears. I was like screaming in the middle of the ring, which I never do. And that's just so the concern that I had that I was not so confident that I was going to win the fight but yeah that um, changed that whole idea like you know what I'm not going to stop anymore I'm not it's not my job to stop the referee is going to have to physically grab me physically tell me it's done I'm not going to assume that okay his arms break I'm going to stop I'm going to break until the referee stops so that's where it solidified that way of thinking for me the fight after that you took on Zulu who is Mm -hmm. The same Zulu that fought Hicks and Gracie twice. If, you, if people talk about Hicks and Gracie, they always bring up the videotape of him taking on Zulu, this big black fighter, scary, mythical, mysterious, you know, like character, you know, a legend, but not really a legend if you think about it because his record is not so great. When you were, when you were about to face him, did you feel the same way? Well, you know, yeah. You know what the ironic thing is? The reason why I got into Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, was I saw Hickson beat Zulu on the second fight. When I saw that, I was like, holy shit, that little Brazilian guy just beat that big black guy. I'm like, holy shit, this is hard for me. And I remember 
understanding that no one wanted to fight Hickson. Zulu was the only one that wanted to fight Hickson, and twice he fought Hickson. So for me, Zulu was like this, this, this monster, this legendary person that the, had the courage to fight Hickson Gracie. Mm -hmm. So when his name came up to fight, I was like, hell yeah. Because he was someone that I kind of felt a little bit of aura and of fear in him mm -hmm. to think of fighting Zulu. And it didn't even dawn on me. He's 50 years old, you know, that kind of stuff. It didn't matter. Zulu was Zulu. Mm -hmm. I remember when that fight came up, I'm like, you know, for me, the more worried I was, the more intent, the more intent I had to kill him mm -hmm. as fast as I can in, in any way that I could. So the fear that I had of Zulu just had this feeling of that I, I really had to kill him before he kills me. And, and you know, it might be a strong word to use, but you know, I, that's how I felt. I, I was in there to kill Zulu, hoping that he doesn't kill me first, understanding that he was there to kill me also. So, yeah, so that fight was booked. And I was also having an offer to fight in the UFC. It was a UFC 13 in the middleweight tournament. So when, they, when I got that offer, I thought, okay, UFC has elbows, um, bare-fisted. I say, I, so I asked Sayam, I said, you know what, can we have a special rules on this? Because I want to start training and get ready for the UFC. Mm -hmm. He goes, what? I said, I want to have elbows included, and I want to fight bare-fisted. He goes, oh, bare-fisted? I don't think we can do that. And I'm like, oh, shit. But UFC, I'm going to fight bare-fisted. He goes, oh, but in Japan, maybe difficult. I said, oh, shit. How about elbows? Said, no problem. We can do elbows. I said, okay, elbows. So that rule was like special rules. They allowed elbows because... Not because I thought it was an advantage for me. I just thought that if I'm going to fight in the UFC and I can use elbows, I need to experience using elbows or having the elbows used against me. So that was a little bit of different ruling. They had a different set of rules in that one where they allowed elbows. Unfortunately, I, could, I had to put on the glove. <laughs> now, with the fight with Zulu, there is some backstory to that, right? There's some kind of controversy yeah. that was... Was it in the lead up to it or was it after it or was it during it? What was going on with that fight? Okay, so Zulu was considered loot delivery. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I considered myself Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. As we all know, back in the day, loot delivery was the biggest rival of Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. You had Hugo Duarte, fought Hickson. You had, um, uh, I forget that black guy's name that fought um, Hoyler in the gym. But he, Eugenio Tadu, Ta Tadu. He was also a Luta Livra. All those guys that even gave Jiu-Jitsu any problems with Luta Livra guys. Mm -hmm. So for me, I saw myself as Jiu-Jitsu side and I saw Zulu as Luta Livra. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to fucking represent Jiu-Jitsu and beat up this Luta Livra guy. Okay, good, good deal, good deal. Okay. I get into the ring. I look in the corner and John Arboto, one of the elite Jiu-Jitsu guys in his corner. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing in his corner? Jiu-Jitsu and... Jiu-Jitsu, but you're cornering, uh, because he's Brazilian, you're going to turn your back on the loyalty to Jiu-Jitsu, and you're going to go corner him. So I'm like, motherfucker. So I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, what the fuck, this traitor? I'm staring at John Arbolto, you motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And then he starts complaining about the way I tape my hands up. I mean, you're allowed to tape, and it was understood. But I guess Lulu didn't tape his hands, and he didn't know he could or whatever. I don't know what the problem was. He starts going to that extent, not only just cornering Zulu, grumbling for him against a jiu-jitsu guy. So right there, I'm super pissed off seeing this motherfucker. One, I'm already ready to fight like an animal ready to eat. And he's holding me back from fighting. I'm already getting frustrated on that. And then I'm thinking, this guy is freaking arguing for the delivery. So I'm super pissed off. And then when the fight happens, you see there's a lot of emotion in there. I'm ready to kill him. And I'm elbowing him in the back of the head. And then when the referee comes to stop me, I, I, I just, just, just emotion is like, I fucking just one more. So I kind of shut the referee off with one more punch and stood up. And then after that, you see me screaming. I'm not screaming at Zulu. I'm looking at the referee. I mean, not looking at John Roberto, asking him, are you jiu-jitsu? You look at my mom, I'm saying, are you jiu-jitsu? Are you jiu-jitsu? I'm telling him that. So I'm super upset of the fact that he betrayed jiu-jitsu. And that was the whole thing behind the whole thing. I wanted to go run and kick Alberto in the face. I was super pissed off and I felt betrayed. And that's where I think there was another mind change in me that, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not jiu-jitsu. Because if Brazilian, the, ethnic, the 
you know, his nationality is going to weigh over the jiu-jitsu loyalty. Maybe I'm not really jiu-jitsu anymore. And that's where I started thinking, like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I got to rethink things. And, you know, I, up until then, I had jiu-jitsu on my shorts. I gave jiu-jitsu all the credit. But then it seemed like maybe I had the long, wrong inkling of what jiu-jitsu was and what the loyalty for jiu-jitsu and ju the loyalty jiu-jitsu had for me. When you went back and talked to the Gracies about this situation, what, did, what was their response? I didn't. I have never did. Um, I still had a good relationship with Hickson, with Hensel, with, uh, with Helsin. I still had a good relationship with everybody. So as far as I'm concerned, I just, in my head, thought Jordan Bolta is a dumb shit. Mm. And, of course, it gave me a little bit of a, you know, a red flag, like, shit, what is this? What is this jiu-jitsu? Is, is this loyalty? What kind of loyalty did it have? It gave me a little bit of a, 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 red, a red caution, like, like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Maybe it's different. But I wasn't about to go grumble about anything. Mm -hmm. And, oh, well, the other thing that happened before that, I didn't get to tell you guys about, but, you know, my first fight, when I got into the first fight, I put had Gracie Jiu-Jitsu on my shorts. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was was boasting 60 years of no no defeats, you know? And I guess for me to put that on, being a blue belt, and if I lose, it might look like Gracie Jitsu lost. Mm -hmm. So what, I was surprised because I thought I was representing Jiu Jitsu proud. And when I went back, Hori, um, Helsin came and told me, Horian called him, saw the fight and said that I have to take the Jiu Jitsu patch off my shorts. And I was like, whoa, I was kind of taken aback. I was like, well, I was representing you guys. I thought you guys would be stoked. But I, I came to find out that maybe he was afraid that I was going to lose and blemish the crazy jiu-jitsu name. So I had to take it off. And that was a little bit of a red flag already for me. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm not jiu-jitsu. And then when that happened, it kind of made everything like, oh, I got to really rethink this whole thing about the loyalty that jiu-jitsu has for me. But now, of course, it didn't affect my relationship with Hickson or Helson or um, um, Henzor in any way. I'm, as far as I was concerned, they, it was I think it was Horian and then John. I, I kind of really still had a loyalty to Jiu-Jitsu, and I was thinking that it's Horian, and Horian is too much of a businessman, and he's looking to business to have true loyalty. And then I thought, John Roberto, what the fuck's wrong with him? <laughs> so I didn't personally take it of offense of, of jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. but it did raise a little red caution flag for me during that whole time you know between 1995 to 1997 before you entered the ufc you were bouncing back from shudo and valley Tudo, japan now moving back and forth it was very simple because it was both owned by the same person right that's what you were saying earlier yeah, now, yeah so it's pretty much i was fighting for the same association so back then, were you signed like a multi-fight deal or were you just fighting? Were you just signing fight by fight? Fight by fight. So Valley Japan was like a showcase of the top shoot fighters. Mm. So because I was a top heavyweight contender or one of the best heavyweight fighters, which they had very few of them, I was also always asked for every Valley Tudo fight to fight in the Valley Tudo fights. So yeah, so it was just one. It was association, and it wasn't. It wasn't like it was today. There's no, um, you know, a contract that locks you in into the fight. You only got to fight for the UFC. You only got to fight for Bellator. It's straight up, one fight at a time. And if I if I decide I want to fight with the UFC, I can fight with the UFC. If I want to fight with Pride later on, I can fight with Pride. So it was pretty much an open contract. I mean, Shuto lost a lot of fighters because of that, but I think that's that care that Shuto had for the fighters that they allowed them to go into bigger stages if they had to. They didn't want to lock them down and hold back their career. So, yeah, it was one fight at a time. And I was, I was like fighting for like three grand, two grand, basically peanuts. Mm 